Tuckered in Reef in Barnegat Bay. I am Dr. Christine Thompson. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today is a special day. This is why we were planning to have this event today. We could have had it any day as long as we could make it out here. But today is going to be our fourth planting and the biggest planting in terms of volume on this oyster reef site. So uh, we have uh, several guests here today. I'm not uh, alone on the boat. Um, different people are going to talk about their role in this project and we're also going to show the oysters actually being planted on this site. So people involved in this project, uh, Steve Everett, he is the uh, manager at the, the field station. Uh, he has uh, done a lot from this project from the beginning. I also have Dr. Anna Pfeiffer Herbert. She is here and she's going to talk about water quality sampling. And I also have Angela Anderson. She is the sustainability coordinator uh, with Long Beach Township. And so she has brought new life to this project in terms of a shell recycling program. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is restoration and why oysters need to be restored. So essentially, all along the east coast, an estuary should have oyster reefs in them. And for a variety of reasons, some human, direct human interference, some indirect human interference, oysters have declined dramatically over the past 100 years. A typical estuary should have thriving oyster reefs. Barnegat Bay is an example. Historically, there were millions of oysters in Barnegat Bay. When you have a thriving oyster reef, you will get the ecological benefits along with it, such as creating habitat for fish and other invertebrates, as well as benefits of water quality filtration. So think of an individual oyster as kind of being a mini vacuum cleaner. So if you have a whole reef of oysters within an estuary, that water will be cleared of suspended, suspended sediment, mud, extra phytoplankton, and kind of creating a better environment for humans and the species that live there. So when we restore an oyster reef, we essentially rebuild a population of oysters, and alongside that, we bring the habitat and the water quality benefits. So I'm just gonna pause for a second as the barge approaches and goes in the background um, as they begin to set up their planting. And we're gonna go over how this planting is done and um, how we do it. So welcome everyone, uh, Christine mentioned Steve Everett, I've been involved in this project uh, since the beginning. Started in uh, 2015 with funding from the Barnegat Bay Partnership. Uh, that was when we first put down any uh, oysters in this part of the bay. There are natural oysters in this part of the bay, but uh, those numbers have been low historically. This process here in particular uh, helps jumpstart that oyster population. Uh, that coupled with uh, oyster farming throughout this system, we believe, and the data is showing, is leading to an increase in natural recruitment. So we have four acres here in total. Uh, today, uh, Parsons Mariculture and his team will be planting about a half an acre of the bay bottom that we have. <clears throat> this is about 725, 750 bushels of uh, recycled shell that Angela will talk a little bit later about that program. On those shells are uh, young oysters or oyster spat, which Dr. Thompson will talk a little bit more about. And much of the funding that we have now is based on uh, water quality improvements that uh, healthy oyster populations can um, foster in a, in a bay system like this. And Dr. Pfeiffer Herbert will talk a little bit about that. So, thanks for joining us today. I might be back on with some questions a little bit later on, but I'll give it back to uh, Christine. Okay, so, I forgot to mention, as I was introducing my co-host, I forgot to mention uh, the partners in this project. We can see Dale Parsons of Parsons Seafood was back there with his employees. 
But funding comes from the Barney Bay Partnership. They have funded this study for uh, four years now, as well as the Jetty Rock Foundation. Um, they are integral in setting up some of the recycling programs and, and funding that and raising money to support the shell recycling. about oysters creating habitat, what I have here are two different ear classes or age classes of oysters. So these oysters we sampled yesterday in our routine monitoring of the reef. And when we monitor the reef, uh, we want to look at the survivorship of the oyster. So uh, how many are alive versus how many are dead. And also the growth of oysters. So we're monitoring their size density over time will give us an idea of how the population that we planted is doing. So these oysters shown here are quite large. So if you can see them, they just about fill my hand. So for comparison, this is a market size oyster. This would be an oyster size that you would get at a restaurant. So these oysters are uh, four years old, so they will be entering their fifth growing season this summer. So the fact that we've had living oysters on this reef in, in five, for five years, or four years, is pretty encouraging um, to their uh, survivability. And they fought off a few hardships along the way. Um, they are a disease resistant oyster, so there is a disease in this area, and so these oysters have been bred. Uh, with records to be resistant to this pathogen, which helps them obviously not die of disease. There's also um, a sponge called a yellow boring sponge, and you can see some of these marks here that even though it doesn't eat the oysters, it can kind of corrode their shells and eventually lead the oysters to just um, get eaten by other things or kind of break off and get smothered. So that unfortunately is not the best sign, but we have McClinney, still plenty of hardy oysters that are making it. So these are our older oysters. These oysters here are one-year-old oysters. So these were planted last year. This planting was primarily done on recycled shell. So Angela Anderson is going to talk a little bit later about the shell recycling program. But the important thing to note is that these oysters were set and grown on shell that was once consumed by somebody at a restaurant in Ocean County. So to understand how we store oysters, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the biology of oysters because that plays a role in how we plant them as well as what they do for our ecosystem services. So I'm going to shuck this oyster that was already started. Please don't try this at home. If you want a regular demonstration for how to shuck, watch an oyster farmer do it. kind of see how the boring shell has eroded into the shell of the oyster. Yeah, it's popped off. I just gotta cut the other. Alright, so this is an oyster. And so this is one of our um, this could be a year old oyster actually. It looks pretty pretty good. It's pretty big. Um, and so this is the body of the animal. So oysters are animals. They are mollusks, so they are related to things like clams, scallops, other shellfish that you eat, as well as squid, octopus, snails, even land snails. Um, so some of the character characteristic features of a bivalve mollusk is that it has two shells. So you can see the shell comes in two parts. Um, usually in oysters, one side is a little bit rounder and more cupped than the flatter side. So they kind of have asymmetrical valves. The body of the oyster, so it's hard to see, kind of. Um, so they breathe and filter water through gills. And so that are these kind of feathery structures shown here. And the gills are important because that allows it to feed and also kind of pump water. And so the water that comes in, it gets pumped 
through the oyster, through the gills. The gills kind of act as a little filter themselves. And so they can kind of funnel the particles that it wants to eat into the mouth. The oyster has a special capability of being able to reject food that it doesn't want or kind of particles that it doesn't want. I kind of think of it as like a baby or a toddler that you eat something that they don't like and they spit it out. So an oyster will do that as well. So if it gets, you know, pieces of sand or mud that's not really great food, what it wants to eat is something like phytoplankton um, or organic material that has some kind of nutrient value to it. It'll spit it out, but it's bound in its mucus, essentially it's spit. And so that can kind of settle into the sediment. So essentially it's feeding, but also kind of rejecting these particles and putting them into the sediment just like it was particles that it wants to eat will go into its digestive system through its mouth, which is right about here, and enter its visceral mass, which is shown here. And so this will have its stomach and its intestines, and then the food that it does eat and digest will come out of the, of the anus. What's shown here, what I had to cut through, that's the adductor muscle that keeps the shells intact. Um, so you have kind of, um, it goes through both shells and, and keeps the oyster together. So anytime you shuck an oyster to eat it, you have to cut through that muscle. What this oyster doesn't have is gonads. So it's not really a ripe oyster, but if it was ripe, you would see kind of this milky substance um, on top of its stomach and its visceral mass. And so oysters, they could be either male or female. They are not one at the same time, but they can actually their sex throughout their life cycle. So typically a young oyster will start out as male and it'll switch to being female after a year. They can only switch back to being male. It's kind of not really known why or you know what the mechanism that may cause them to switch. But you can tell the sex of an oyster basically by what kind of gametes it releases from its gonads. So if it releases eggs, it's a female. If it releases sperm, it is a male. And by releasing it, it essentially just uh, throws its gametes out into the water and they fertilize outside the oyster. So that's called external fertilization. So in a natural thriving oyster reef, you'll have eggs and sperm meeting in the water column. They'll develop into larvae. Those larvae will float around in the estuary until it finds a hard spot to, to settle, like a, another oyster shell or an empty oyster shell or a rock or a piling. So if you have an estuary covered in oyster reefs, it's a pretty good chance that that larvae is going to find a house, a home, on another oyster shell. When you're limited in the amount of oysters in oyster reefs, it um, becomes a lot harder for the larvae to attach to an oyster reef. So for our restoration project, because there are not a lot of oyster reefs in Barnegat Bay, we kind of have to jumpstart that process. And so we do this through So remote setting, you fill up pages in tanks of some kind of substrate. So in this case, we use whelk shell substrate. In more recent years, like now, we use recycled oyster shell. And so here you have uh, a shell that other oysters have settled onto. So in these tanks, for the larvae, as I mentioned, the larvae comes from, um, from Rutgers. They have a hatchery that creates these, uh, that spawns these disease resistant oysters, which kind of do well in, in our bank. So, a lot of these have died. Um, there's a few that are sticking around here. And so, after about a month, the larvae, so they settle onto the shells right away. They grow out in the tanks for about a month. So, this year that was done in May. And then, when they're about five to ten millimeters in size, they will. Um, they will be yeah. and So that's what we're seeing today. All of those shells being blown up onto the reef have baby oysters called spat attached to them. So remember that spat. If anybody uses the term spat, it refers to these tiny oysters that are on the shell. So next, I'm going to talk more about. Um, we're going to talk about the scientific role that uh, we play, uh, the play in the oyster reef. So how we monitor the success. So we talked about monitoring the, the biology of the oysters, the survivorship of the oysters. But I also mentioned how restoration projects usually look for ecological benefits. So benefits beyond just the oysters themselves. And so that's habitat and water quality. So in our 
EMT monitoring, we monitor the water quality, and that is uh, able to tell us how much the oysters filter, and we monitor the habitat as well, so how many species are living in and among the oysters. So I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Anna Pfeiffer Herbert. Uh, she is an oceanographer at Stockton, and she's going to talk about the water, monitor water monitoring program that we have on the reef and how we can use that data to know how oysters are improving water quality in Barney Bay. Great. I'm going to step around here. Okay.
So over the season, as the temperature changes, that's going to affect the way that the oysters are filtering. So just like if you go out and exercise, um, your muscles have to get kind of warmed up. So the oysters at really cold temperatures will slow down and stop pumping water. Um, they'll get faster and faster at filtering water up to a point. When it gets too hot, like maybe in August, where the water can get up to 80 degrees, um, then they'll start to slow down a little bit. That's stressful for them. So there are parts of the year when they're pumping water at their optimal rate, but most of the year they're actually filtering a little bit more slowly. So we're keeping track of these variables um, so that we can come up with an idea of how much water the oysters on the reef are filtering through themselves. Um, and that water contains things uh, like nitrogen. Nitrogen can be beneficial in certain amounts because it's necessary for growth of plants and plankton. But when it becomes too high, um, the water can become overgrown and we can get conditions such as low oxygen and other you know, environmental problems. And so by measuring what's going on on this reef, um, we will be able to make predictions for if the reef was double in size or 10 times larger, um, how much water could the oysters filter through themselves and how many particles and how many uh, you know, grams of nitrogen can those reefs produce. So as uh, Dr. Thompson mentioned earlier, oysters used to be a lot more prevalent all throughout the bays. Now they're just a fraction of the size. But as restoration starts to increase the size, uh, we are hoping that we'll be able to see measurable water quality benefits. Um, so and another, aside from monitoring the water quality, uh, another measure that we do is in habitat restoration. And so we're going to bring Dr. Thompson back over to talk about um, habitat restoration, if you're ready. Um. Hi, I'm back. So another thing that we do when we go out and monitor is we want to be able to say in a quantitative way how many species are coming to, are using the oyster reef. So how much habitat for how many species are we providing? So in addition to studying the oysters themselves, we have a variety of ways that we monitor the organisms that live on the reef. So one of those ways is just through the regular assessments that we do. And so I'm gonna turn to these monstrosities behind me. And so this is the way that we have been sampling the reef for the past year or so. Um, these are called hydraulic patent cones, and they look really scary, and they kind of are, so we have to use a lot of protective uh, equipment when we use them. They go over the side of the boat, so hopefully, we took some videos last uh, yesterday, so we'll probably be posting some of those videos later on this summer to kind of show how the whole restoration and monitoring process work using these patent cones, so you can check back at the Stockton Facebook page. Some kind of gridded mesh, and then kind of 
kind of estimate, so there are 400 squares here, estimate how many different species cover that mesh. So in an example like this, maybe we'd use a smaller section here, but then I would estimate how many squares are covered by this red sponge. So this is called um, a red beard sponge. I was blanking for a second. There's also um, other types. There's a lot of algae here. Sometimes we get bryozoan. That's another encrusting colonial organism. And I mentioned the yellow boring sponge. Some years we have tunicates or sea squirts that grow. Um, sometimes they can look quite pretty. Um, here's some bryozoan right here. That's actually a good uh, colony to look at. So they're colonial animals. They kind of um, they come out and filter feed. So a lot of these encrusting organisms are actually going to filter water just like the oysters. So adding more, more of these organisms is going to add more filtration capacity as well. Um, over here we have um, a limpet. So this is like a, a gastropod. Um, a one-shelled mollusk and that is growing uh, on another shell. So this is a clam shell that was probably used as substrate. This is red beard sponge. So this is that encrusting sponge they showed on the other oyster that can kind of grow up and grow kind of bushy. So they'll kind of grow more three-dimensionally in their later years, creating more structure. We often see crabs and shrimp and even little fish hiding in among the sponges. Um, in terms of mobile species, the number one um, group of species that uses an oyster reef are crabs. I know they don't look that good right now, um, but we have uh, spider crabs which are very abundant. Um, almost every sample that we take up has a couple spider crabs living on it. Spider crabs are also decorator crabs, so they can use pieces of sponge and um, put them on their bodies to, to camouflage. We had a, a crab in the lab last year that put a rubber band on its head, so sometimes you can see um, funny videos of what these crabs can, can do. There's a character in Moana that is a, Moana that is a decorator crab. Uh, mud crabs. There are several varieties of mud crabs. Mud crabs are a characteristic reef dependent species, so they really utilize the reef throughout their entire life cycle. Um, they lay eggs there, they feed there, they'll feed on young oysters, um, as well as you know they really use that habitat and they're probably some of the more abundant species. Any student that has ever worked with me will learn how to identify them and they always say that is their favorite part is identifying. Another species that I want to talk about is kind of a predator of oysters. So I mentioned some of the, the mud crabs will eat uh, oyster spat. But these uh, snails, although they look kind of pretty, they got that spiral characteristic of a whelk shell. Um, they're pretty nasty predators to oysters and they're called oyster drills. Um, there are two species of oyster drills. So this one is called the thick-lipped oyster drill because the aperture is kind of serrated here and more open. And this is the Atlantic oyster drill, um, which its aperture is fancy. But what these, uh, these snails will do is they have, I um, can't really see one coming out, um, but they have an appendage, it's basically like a pointer, it's called a proboscis and they will drill into an oyster shell, and I have an example, and basically put a pinprick hole. Oh, Steve had one, and I thought I brought it out, but it said I don't. I must have dropped it somewhere. Um, oh no, this is it. Yes. Put it in here. I dropped it in here. Um, so it kind of got a bubble on it, but see that hole? On the shell and so we kind of look for it when we are doing our mortality assessments. So it'll drill through the oyster just with that pinprick and then basically kind of dissolve the tissue and suck it through and carnivorize the oyster. So having drills, even though they're a natural part of the oyster reef, they can kind of decimate the set if they come through and suck 
soak up all the, the waste or spat that we put down. And so luckily last year we didn't have a lot of drill predation. The first year we actually had quite a bit. Um, so fingers crossed this year that they kind of stay um, not too abundant. But another sign that oyster drills are around the reef is their egg cases. I had a sample here and I moved them around the pot. Um, these yellow oyster drill egg cases. So here's an example. And each species lays them. Um, I can't remember which species this morphology is. There's one that's forked, so it kind of has two branches coming out of it. Um, and so usually we kind of rip those off as well. Um, but this is basically baby uh, drill snails that will hatch and wreak havoc on a cluster of oysters. Sometimes we pick up a whole cluster and every oyster on it is um, dead. So sometimes we pull up clams. Oysters, can, even though clams are burrowing mollusks, they don't actually compete with the oysters, but the oysters can kind of make nice food in the sediments that the clams can filter as well. So there's kind of mutual benefits to, you know, increasing the quality um, of, their, of their habitat. So these are like little neck size hard clams. This is kind of a rare find, but we found um, or a case. Um, and it's hard to tell if there's an embryo in here or not, but these, um, it's a, a fish that lays eggs in these cases. Sometimes you see them washed up, dried up on beaches as well. So we pulled one up in our sample yesterday. So in about a minute, we are going to talk more about the restoration program and the shell recycling program. But if anybody that's watching live has any questions, either for myself or for Anna, um, you know, now's the time to, to ask us. Christine, we have a question. Yeah. How do you know how much bottom is covered? So, one way we can estimate it is through the patent point surveys, as I talked about, where, you know, assuming it gets that whole one meter squared, um, we can then um, estimate the density of oysters in that one meter squared. We also have made maps of the reef through uh, sonar technology. So we might be able to talk about that in a little bit. And so that can give us the whole area of the reef. So every sample that we take, then we can back calculate, we can take the average of all the samples and then calculate that over the area of the reef. So for instance, if we have 100 oysters per meter squared and the whole reef is 100 meters squared, then we can see how many oysters um, are, are part of Do the oysters actually remove oysters? That is actually a really interesting question. And so I'm, I'm assuming that the question comes from the oysters being... Uh, it's supposed to say neutral. <laughs> it's supposed to say neutral. But yes, the oysters can actually filter oyster largely as well, although it's uh, kind of fun. <laughs> um, but they actually remove nutrients. Um, yes, they can remove nutrients because they will take in the nutrients and use that to build their biomass. And so one of the things is then when you harvest the oysters and take them out of the bay, you're essentially removing the nutrients that the oysters have used to build their bodies, build their shells, and take them out of the bay. 
Another way that they can remove uh, the, the nutrients is um, is by uh, their, their filtration process and the feces production and their pseudo feces production, that stuff that they spit out that they don't need. If there's any nutrient value in that, that actually goes into the sediment. So they literally poop where they eat. Um, and so that the oyster uh, deposits kind of like go into the sediments and if they don't get resuspended, they're they're considered buried and no longer part of the the water. The water. All right. Another question is: Do you recycle clamshell? Yeah. So you might have noticed that there are some clamshells um, in our samples that oysters have set on, and so yeah, that's part of some of the shell that gets recycled from the restaurants. So it's just clamshell, and Angela is going to talk about that soon. Um, and I'm actually going to take this last question. Um, I will have Angela take that question as well. So you're going to take this question. Oh, you can answer it. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> so I'm going to um, hand it over to Angela Anderson in Long Beach Township, and she's going to talk about this shell recycling program. and we are able to pick 
would have to bring it right back and to go into the bay for restoration, filtration, uh, and, the, and the health of the whole community. That's economic growth, uh, that's tourism growth, uh, but that's also empowerment to the consumer. To say, hey, I, I'm playing a role in all of that great science that's occurring right in my backyard. I, I closed the loop on uh, you know, the, the farm to the table because we have it grown, we eat it, we pick it up, we bring it right back. What made the partnership really work also, um, when you start anything as complex, you know, uh, you know as this huge thing we have going on here, the Tucker Peace Retreat, it started in phases. And in the beginning, um, in 2016, when we were still filming the Oyster Farmers film, Stockton was partnering with Barney to a partnership funded project with the original pilot for the Tucker Release Retreat with the Liberal Society and the um, Old Causeway restaurant. Just trying it out, saying, hey, we collect some shells in the restaurant, you know, cure it for a while, we set some spat on it, and we start to really get this preliminary research retreat going. How will that work? We captured that moment in the end of our film to say, that's the future, that's the call, that's the call to action. Um, so after the film came out, it came, how do we do this on a larger scale? How do you transport the shell? Where are we gonna put it? And that's what Mayor Mancini came in and said, we wanna, we wanna close that loop as far as the transportation and the movement of the shell. And Dale had space behind his uh, seafood restaurant in Tuckerton on Green Street. So it closed the loop in that way. Um, and the design and the promotion from the Jetty Rock Foundation and Jetty, they are a, uh, the Jetty Rock Foundation is the, the uh, nonprofit arm of the Jetty Apparel Company in um, Hawkins. They're a lifestyle surf company. That, that clutch of audience um, became connected to the old world Raymond. And bridging those two gaps is really incredible because we've kind of lost that connection. I think as we get more and more Maybe they really like to eat the oyster, but do they truly know the history of oysters in the Barton Bay and the Light Harbor system? I always think of Dale Parsons here as having one foot in each of those worlds. He's got an old, old world knowledge from his family generation into a new world of you know, being a first generation of oyster farmer. Um, when you have so many new young guys that grew up on the bay, it, within the Barton Oyster Collective, um, you know, Matt Gregg and Scott Lennox, and all of the oyster farmers. Adam Sprague, um, you know, it's an incredible group of people that are bridging the gaps between the whole world and the new oyster. We're having, of course, a little bit of a rough summer with all of the um, restrictions on distancing. But as we return to picking Shell up for the summer of 2020 on Long Island, we want everybody that comes down here to order oysters, order clams. You're not going to get them fresher, you're not going to get them better. And they're going to go right back into the water here. Um, all of our information can be on follow, you can go hashtag follow the show, or you go to the Jetty Rock Foundation or the Long Beach Township. Um, you'll find out some information about it. Um, I want to just give a small plug to um, a new facility that we're building in Long Beach Township. Um, where we are right now at the reef, you can see the top of the water tower over here, uh, right there, red and white. And if you pan over directly right there, you can see the Beach Haven water tower, the nice orange water tower. So we are precisely between Tuckerton and Beach Haven in the Little Egg Harbor section of the Barnegat Bay. And there's no place better, no place more beautiful. When you come here, you know, go keep going a little bit south and in Holgate, the very first street in Holgate, Long Beach Township is opening up a new marine education field station uh, coming next month follow us at LBT Field Station. We are partnering, we are inviting the scientists that are working on this research reef and in the Barnegat Bay ecosystem to utilize our facility, partner with us, do research out of that facility, run tours, um, really get people connected um, through the science, through consumption, into the bay. So we're super excited to plan that additional level of partnership to, to the greater good that we have um, here. So, uh, Question. For people who are cooking and consuming oysters at home rather than at a restaurant, is there a place they can bring their oyster shells? Uh, excellent question. Is exactly, you must be reading my mind whoever asked the question. Uh, it is absolutely something that I would like to see, especially now because everybody is for 
predominantly cooking at home. Um, I'm working on drop-off centers, and one of the things I'm discussing with our restaurant partners is if they would take the shell back from some of the people that they sold it to, if they would have uh, you know the willingness to say, hey, I just got three dozen oysters and uh, you know whatever, and five dozen clams. Can I bring those shells back to your restaurant uh, that I just purchased from? I think we're right for that now because we do have a lot of the home chefs and people are really connected to their food right now. So yes, um, I like that question and I'm definitely going to work on that. Definitely where we're going. We just started recollecting pause shell from March until June first. And we just started back up. And if you know anybody with the lift truck, our truck died on Monday. But we are, we are survivors. <laughs> we are, uh, we are, we are. But anyway, we're picking up two days a week. Um, and we love all of our restaurants. Please look up the names of all of the restaurants that are participating in this. It's fully voluntary on their part, and they're very proud to be supporting um, their consumers, their growers, and the science of the bay. Because without a healthy Brighton and Bay ecosystem. Um, there would be a reason for these restaurants and livelihoods to be here. So we all play a role in it, and Lone Township and all of our partners are really proud um, to, to bring the science to the people and bring the people to the science. So, uh, well, yeah, so almost all that shell is ours. We did almost 4,000 bushels since we started in 2017. Yeah, that's the crew from Jetty. Hey guys. So there's another partner. So the Jetty and the Jetty Rock Foundation. Go no, you're good. Go for it. <laughs> you're right. live. You are in it. They are the design and marketing geniuses uh, that really engage all age groups. Hey, how's the depth out here? Oh, yeah. Our goal is to double the amount of shell each season, so we hope that we can do this season, of course, will be a little low. Next, 2021 is going to be our our season, and we hope that we can get about 3,000 bushels of shell. And, and for reference on that, what just what just went overboard today was 725 bushels, right? With possibly millions of oysters fat on them once we figure it out. But just to, just to give you an understanding, what did you say, 3,000 bushels? Uh, we're nearly 4,000. We've done yeah, So four, four times four. that. So with the proper funding, we could be doing four, four times that uh, that planning in, in any given year. So keep eating oysters and clams. Yes. Load up. They're full of zinc, which is good for your immune system. <laughs> Do we have more? I think we have more. Yeah, we have more questions. Some more questions. Um, are there more questions? Yeah, there are some. Did you uh, take the one about the the oyster spat? The question from Matthew. Yeah, Matt. So Matthew says, by providing a, a hard substrate to the benthos, are the natural oyster spat able to come about beyond just the ones that you're depositing on the reefs? Yeah, so that is a good question. And that is actually from the Stockton student, Matthew Mason. Um, shout out to any students that might be watching, um, but are influenced too. Mm -hmm. But that is another restoration goal that we would like to see, um, is that oysters are able to
how many sets. And we also do that to gauge habitat value using the shell and structure pages and stuff like that. But we also see oysters on this naked shell that we put out. So that is a sign that oyster larvae are coming uh, from these areas. But we don't actually know without genetic testing, which is very difficult to do, if those oysters are the oysters we planted or oysters, wild oysters, oysters coming from Hurry. 